Everybody, Tom Matuska and Brent Wingfield again with you, Thursday Matuska Taxidermy Live presentation. And um, you did it all by yourself last week, I understand. And Kate, and Kate, we were all by our lonesome. Well, I'm back, and I missed it. And Why did you miss it? Well, I was, I was 40 feet underwater, I guess. <laughs> Literally. No, um, I got to go to Florida, and we got to catch some lobsters and do some some fishing. Wow. So a lot of sharks, a lot of big carpin, and, and it's warm down there this time of the year. Um, this is not a good time to vacation in Florida, just so you know. But the marine life activity, I think, is pretty vibrant this time of the year. And uh, I got bit by a tarpon. Did you bring me back an iguana? Oh, man, man. Anybody wants to go iguana hunting, there are trophy iguanas down there, the <laughs> biggest iguanas I could ever imagine. And they're on the side of the road grazing like crows do in Walmart parking lot here, you know? Um, but it was pretty fun. I uh, went down with Mandy and her husband and friends. And um, like I said, got to, got to chase around some lobsters and, and get some, very fun. bring some home. And it was pretty fun. When are we having lobster? Well, I'm not sure how many we got, uh, you know. And if I had the, I, I always say it, if I had to survive on what I grew or shot or caught, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be carrying around this. All your questions, and um, I heard that Brett did a really good job, and... We limped through. Well, I'm we sure it. you limped we very, very well. And uh, so today we're going to carry on and, and eventually we're going to finish this walleye project. The marathon walleye. Marathon walleye. But, you know, anybody that uh, um, wants to know any step that we put into anything, whether it's a, a deer head or a fish mount or whatever, they can go back through our YouTube um, archives or our Facebook Live um, archives and see how we do things. And we necessarily don't do things exactly the right way or the way um, some of you would choose to do it, but we get the job done and um, yes, we do. tend, tend to put out some pretty nice trophies here. So if you wanna see how we got to this point, um, all you have to do is go back in the archives and, and see um, whether it's paint or mixing paint or eyes or um, backboards or putting in a hanger, you know, putting in a mounting rod, wh whichever, you know, part that you think you, we weren't, you didn't get clear, um, go back and watch. It's all there for you. Yep. So that's, that's pretty good for all of you. So this is the walleye. We've kind of got a, a two part walleye, um, extravaganza going yeah <laughs> so we work on this one a little bit then we work on this one and we want to show you what the project's going to end up looking like so we get that one to a point and then we show you on this so we kind of have a tag team you know walleye going here and uh i think what you've done you've showed them a, a lot here um you showed all the tipping yep we and, showed them basically all the hand stuff and hand, we paint a lot of, uh, we do a lot of hand work on our, mm -hmm. on our fish, whether it's the tipping or, you know, little highlights. Um, sometimes it's way easier to pick up a, a paintbrush or a water pen and do a little hand painting, which really um, enhances the overall product. Uh, we used to, in the olden days, to paint a walleye. I had a pattern when I learned how to do taxidermy and how to paint fish. I had a walleye pattern and it consisted of probably five colors and you airbrushed those on and up in the top of the corner it said um, four to six minutes. That was <laughs> the total time meant by my instructor to paint that walleye. Yep. You know, four to six minutes. If it doesn't look good by then, um, you never messed around with any of this type of stuff. And, and basically, when it's on the wall at 20 feet, nobody could tell the difference. But uh, 
we want ours to really pop. We want people to be examine them close up. Um, we want to see all the details. We want them more vibrant. And um, that's why we tend to do a lot of the hand painting. Mm -hmm. We use a lot of uh, pearl X's, liquid scales, yep. pan pastels, yep. Createx, um, lacquer if that's your choice. Um, just a lot of different methods and there isn't a right or a wrong method and just whatever works good for you and whatever really what what do you like does that was that easy for you did it give you the effects that you wanted um, if so pursue that method so um, I think we'll carry on a little bit and and what we want to do you've got that fish pretty much ready to to gloss so at the end of the uh, presentation today we're going to you know, show you a gloss method that we think works pretty good and gives you a, a nice glossy fish. Um, some people don't like a high gloss. I've always leaned towards a, a wet looking fish. I think but it, if that's not your yeah. um, choice, there's other methods. Yeah, we like that gloss. It enhances all the hand work that we just talked about. All those pretty little scale tipping things come out nice. With and it makes them strong. Gloss. Yep. Um, it makes them easy to dust, mm -hmm. um, keep scales from lifting. So that's what we like to do. Um, something I'd like to, we haven't done very much to this fish here. Brett did do the, the tipping and some of the modeling on the head, which looks real nice. And one of the next things that we like to do is if you will look at, maybe Kate can zoom in on this picture if you tell me where you want it. Is that good? Um, look at all of the yellow spots, yellow markings on this fish. And walleyes come in a multitude of colors. You're going to go up north and, and this uh, in that uh, water with tannins in it and that yellow is going to be more of an orange. Um, but there's a whole lot of yellow and different lakes around here um, can be more yellow than other lakes. In the winter time, they can be, um, I'm gonna show you another one here. Here's the head, look at the markings in the head. In the winter time, they can be um, paler, colder water, deeper water, they can be paler. Um, warmer, um, shallower water, they can be more colorful. And we used to have a, fun little thing we would do and we would we have a glass box that mm -hmm. got broken we need to make another one <laughs> we do but we would put the fish in a glass box we did this with smallmouth and <clears throat> we took pictures of him and we covered him with a canvas and he was smallmouthy color nice and nice and marked and barred up we'd cover him with a canvas and let it get really really dark take it off and when you take it off he would turn very, very pale. And my first experience with that was my, my brother had a, uh, an aquarium and mm -hmm. I came home one night, turned on the lights and the fish were like light gray. They're oh. like they're dying. I'm thinking these fish are dying and I get all panicky. It was because it was their, their nighttime choice of coloration and they're, they're very, very pale. You can't even see hmm. them. Um, walleyes off our dock in the fall when we're, when we're fishing, um, they can swim right down along the bottom and you can't see them because they're, they're blending. That's how they survive. And uh, so there's a lot of different colors, but the smallmouth coloration is real interesting because you cover him up with a canvas to where no light could get through and he paled out really, really, yeah. really bland, very, very bland. You take the canvas off, leave him in the sun, and he starts starting to worry about breathing and he would start getting vibrant, 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 yeah. vibrant. And we have pictures of smallmouth that are so heavily marked, people don't even believe that it's a real fish, yeah. but it was because he was fighting for oxygen and yeah. uh, seemed to be that's the yeah. reason. He might add other, re other reasons, um, but uh, he got very, very b vibrant. We would cut the, cut the air down into the, into the box and that changed to change their coloration. Um, we would give them a lot of air, that would change the coloration. So a lot of things affect fish. So you're gonna have customers come into your shop and they're gonna say, oh, I like that one right there. So all you need to do is remember what they liked, write it down on the ticket, um, color like, you know, 
um, walleye or smallmouth or largemouth, you know, of either customers that you remember, take a, take a snapshot of it and paper clip it right to the person's, um, person's ticket. We a lot of times will have um, pictures like this, just paper clipped to their ticket so that we can match whatever the customer likes. But the one thing that um, most of our walleyes have, they have chains, I call them chains, they're connecting um, scales that, uh, and, and it's pretty much the whole inside blush of the scale, I'd call it, and is real, real yellow. And so we're gonna put that in. And there's lots and lots of different ways to do that. And one of our quickest, easiest, um, rinky-dinkiest ways to do it, <laughs> but it, it does work for us, um, is with a Copic marker, and this is a Y08 number, and it's got two tips. It's got a pointed tip. The back is a calligraphy tip, which we never use, but we should. We should. Um, and before I get started, I'm going to notice on this fish, I'm going to do a little bit on his head. Um, the yellow doesn't go down very heavy down below his eye. So I'm going to concentrate my markings up into the top of the head. If you ever catch a walleye and look at the top of their head, they're always mottled and, and you have some real nice dark striations through here along with a nice olive color. But there's going to be a little bit of yellow in there also. And then I'm going to just color some of these markings that he already has. The one thing I learned a long time ago is when you start, and you got to do it on reproduction fish, you have to invent all of these markings and shapes. And if you get those shapes not of a characteristic walleye configuration or smallmouth or northern, whatever it happens to be, you're in trouble off the bat. So you have to, you have to copy these shapes in a natural manner. Now, the good thing about a skin mount is they're already here for us. Mm -hmm. We don't have to copy anything. Um, we just have to color what's there. Now, I can do this with an airbrush, and if I did it with an mm -hmm. airbrush, I think I would thin down my paint. I'd mix yeah. up my um, Createx paint, and I would thin it very, very thin. I would turn my air pressure way down low, maybe, what would you say? Oh, eight, yeah. Eight, yep. under 10, anyway. Yep. And spray it it's gonna it's gonna color your light areas but it's not gonna affect your dark areas it's not like painting a barn where red turns the dark stuff red just like the light stuff red so to do this I'm gonna pesky fly in here um, I'm just gonna take this little pan and just be careful you can always make it heavier now remember, not much past the eye. We can always bring it down later. Now these are real little, I don't know, almost amoeba shaped. If you know what an amoeba is, it's just a little kind of a map looking marking. Now look how fast this is. I can just go like crazy. Up on the top of the head, um, who knows if there is one there? There is now, you know. Um, you can just add a lot of color that when you put your gloss on, it's going to look real nice. Down along this lip line, if you look at the lip, he has, he has color along the lip, some yellows, some pearls, some dark areas. The dark areas are already here. I don't have to hit those. I'm just going to bring a little bit of yellow from the pan down on there. Along the bottom lip, I'd like to include a little bit of um, yellow from the pen, but because you're on a white surface here, um, go real easy. Not doing canaries. <laughs> it's chewing on crayons. And we do, we do spend, I don't want to say a lot of time on the back of the fish, but um, I always tell people we finish them um, seven eighths around the fish, sure. so we'll do this whole process to the to the back of the fish also, but um, not not near as much as we do on the show side.
And if you have any um, questions or need some clarification on anything we're doing here, text us in. Okay, now I don't know if you can see that, that head. If I want to yellow him up a little more, I can. Now this is much better than taking the airbrush and blasting yellow yes. through him yep. because the whole fish, it, he might be of a yellow cast, but you can always do that later if you want to. For right now, we're giving him just a, we're highlighting those markings. And now if I look at the side of the fish, some fish can have yellow all the way down to the belly. I tend to like some of that pearl that you have on here and the, and the silver markings coming up like you did here. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I don't wanna, I, I don't wanna yellow him down here yet. I'm gonna stand back and look at him and then decide what I wanna do here. Now, oftentimes the walleye markings, I call it run in chains. It's like a scale. There's one, two, three, four, five here. There's two down here, seven here, four here, six here, um, if that makes sense. So I'm just gonna hit a few in a row here. I'm gonna drop down a line. I'm gonna go a few more. Go up a line and just go through the whole side of the fish. Now this is so easy. Even a caveman can do it. I was gonna say that and I didn't. Now this, um, 08 yellow is a vibrant, vibrant yellow, and you can um, go crazy with it and make it a little too yellow, so be a little careful. Um, there's a couple other good yellows, too, on the Oranger cast. Um, 17, was that yeah, a? Yeah, 17 was one. Um, I think there might be a 15, too. Um, but several of them just choose your color according to your reference pictures. Now, I like, I think what really looks nice on a walleye is um, up on the back. They have a, a lot of colors that you would think they're just dark on the back, but upon careful inspection, um, there's yellows, there's greens, there's yep. golds, there's a multitude of chameleon-like modeling up here, and um, nobody's gonna know if you have it exactly the way that fish was, and you have a uh, a lot of gold tipping over here, and I'm hitting some of that with this yellow, and it's just popping out of here like a, you know, a bright, bright golden area. It's really pretty. And like Brett brought in all this silver in here and pearl down here, I don't want to, I might put a little yellow in amongst it, but I don't want to take away what he did there. I like that. And all you have to do is look at the, the fish around you or the fish that are coming into your shop and where they're coming from and are they a yellow variety, are they a silver variety, are they a deep golden variety? and keep pictures and reference of all the different color phases to share with your customers and see what they're looking for. Did you just tell them they need to go fishing? They need, need to go fishing. Lots of pictures, need lots to, and lots of pictures. Need to go Florida fishing, walleye. That's right, and lobsters. <laughs> Are you holding it for him bounce? I'm pretty good at hitting the bounce. Bass. Now you can go you can go crazy and just go dot 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 dot. I am, believe it or not, trying to have a little strategy in where I'm going here. And start up high. Um, up high, if you do something disastrously wrong. Um, or unnatural, nobody's going to know because you're putting it on a more of a dark area of that fish. If you um, get down into the lighter area, every dot is going to show. So, and that's a w bad term to use is dot. They're not dots. They're actual kind of a blush in the, 
fin. The fin pocket has a dark area around it. It's darker at the, at the base of the fin, the beginning of the, or a scale, I'm sorry, uh, beginning of the scale, but um, there's a dark perimeter around it and you don't want to block out all of that. So I think you get the idea, and I don't know if you can. As, as, he, as you go down towards the belly of the fish, I would lessen the yellow myself. Does that show up? Yeah, it's starting to look nice. And you can always do more. Um, just it's hard, hard to get off if you do too much. Um, and some of you are probably going to say, um, I've done some markers on my fish, trout spots, things like that, oh, only gosh. to have them run. And that can happen when you gloss the fish. Um, if you put a heavy gloss on here, the yellow is going to run like raindrops on the side of your fish. We're going to show you how not to, how not to do that. Hopefully. <laughs> here we are, public TV, and boy, did we <laughs> screw that one up. Okay, another thing, if you look at uh, this fish, and I don't know if you can see it very good, but he has yellow in his dorsal fin, on his mm -hmm. spiny dorsal, and they're just kind of areas. They're, bad word again, more spots, just they're spots. And if you look at the soft dorsal, um, he has yellow also. And you're going to see where those are just by where the light areas are, especially in the soft dorsal. But I'm just going to take the pen and I'm going to run it little spotted areas up the spine. And don't, don't make too big of an area. Now, if anything, anything disastrously happened here and you got way too much yellow or yellow that you didn't want, um, you could take a little, you know, lacquer thinner or 4011 or we'll alcohol or anything like that, and you can wipe it right off. Now here, I have much more light areas on this soft dorsal, so I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna draw yellow attention to him, if you know what I mean. Now you can do this with an airbrush. Like I said, if you did it with an airbrush, I'd thin your paint considerably, turn the pressure way down. But I can't paint with an airbrush as fast as I can do this. Now just remember what you're doing here and don't be afraid to grab that pen and do it again as you uh, finish up this fish. As you look at him, you're going to might say, oh, I think he needs a little more here, or I stopped it too abruptly. I can tell right now I stopped, stopped my yellow spots, and I don't want them to show up gaudy, so I'm starting to resort to putting them in the darker areas, and it doesn't show up quite as harsh. Up on the top, I kind of did it in the light areas. Down here, I'm putting it in the darker um, scale seats. Okay, but that'll give you an idea of that. Copic marker, we use it on a lot of different things and it we works do. really good. Comes in a multitude of colors. Um, we like that. Yeah. If anything goes wrong, got a question? Oh, no. <laughs> I've been gone so long, I don't know the terminology. <laughs> <laughs> two hands, two-handed wave means okay. over here. Now, um, another thing I like to do is I treat the fins, and you jump in because you do things different than I do. Um, so tell them when I'm doing something, no, another doing way of doing things, the right way of doing like things. Um, something, if you notice, and I don't think you can probably see it in, on film, but the, look at all the flesh around that tail, the base of that tail. Oh, yeah. 
and you probably can't see it, but all the way around there, there's a whole lot of flesh. And you can airbrush that in. We usually have pan pastel sitting right on the table. They're handy. And nothing is easier than to grab a brush and add a little flesh. It's very easy to do and it's a soft, soft, soft flesh. There's no overspray. And the object, I think, is to make these fin rays look like um, there's blood in them. Anytime we're doing a deer face or an elk face or whatever, um, we tend to start with flesh, I think. Mm -hmm. And flesh, to me, gives the illusion of life to dried up skin. Yeah. And here's a good picture I'm gonna put real close, right at the base of this pelvic fin. No, so then they're gonna see that flesh Then they're gonna see there. how bad I'm doing. You can see that. And that's what Tom's putting in, just, just this nice hint of now, I, I put it right over my scales and I covered up nice scale and it looks terrible, but I take my finger and wipe it off the high area and it stayed fleshy down in the low areas. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's not a, I don't wanna say just taught you a trick. It's not a trick, it's just a technique that you can wipe it off the tops of the scales and it stayed down in the pockets. Now, because you're using a powder, um, we want to seal that. I'm going to use workable fixative. Some of you might find that difficult to get these days. I think our purchasing department has it, don't they? Did you buy it all? We bought a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, when you're using fo workable fixative, and we've done everything. We've done um, matte. We've mm -hmm. done sealed it with gloss. We've sealed it with a multitude of other things. And you decided workable fixative is the best best it doesn't um, build up it doesn't yep. give you too thick of a goopy finish yep. um, and it'll s keep that powder from getting it away from you actually recommended to us from, from the Brent. color fin manufacturer okay. and it doesn't take a lot that was just a nice like yep. hairspray yep. and somebody said hairspray one time in one of our lives and that's mm -hmm. something I don't think we've done, but it's not a bad thing to try. To try. To try. <laughs> you didn't learn um, it here. <laughs> um, no, the nice thing is it goes on, on thin, and when it goes on thick, it seems like the powder, some people will call and complain and say that the, it goes away. Went away, yeah. And I think what happens is it actually suspends, that powder lifts and separates and all of a sudden you get, you get a lot more separation between the particles and it doesn't show up as much. So um, by putting it on thin with the workable fixative, um, it locks it into place and gives you a real true look. I notice as I'm doing this, I'm sitting here with my mouth open and I- <laughs> get a fly in there. Well, it reminded me of coming back on the airplane, how you're always falling asleep, falling asleep, <laughs> and then you- wake up, you notice your mouth is hanging open, and you look at the person sitting next to you to see if they noticed if your mouth is hanging open. We had a mask on this time, so nobody knew. Oh, that's right. Now, now this tail to me looks very, very dried out, mm -hmm. and just by carefully putting some of my yellow vermiculation, little markings through here, um, really brings a little life to this tail. And I'm kind of staying a little bit away from the light areas because um, they, will, they will come out a little too yellow for me. But that'll add a lot of... Yeah, that's already really starting to come to life. Another tip too, when they're doing their fins, um, to vary the, the intensity is they can go to the backside, do some of it on the backside too, and you'll see 
with these nice transparent fins that we did with the, the silk span and Mod Podge. Um, that'll give you a nice transition of color that comes through um, on both sides and it'll ac actually give you a little bit of, of a varied intensity. And since you mentioned fins, we'll maybe show them how to do a fin. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at, hand me that one, that's a good one. Um, here's a picture of a live fish again, if you can zoom in on this. This is a pelvic fin, and notice the, notice the gray, the bluey gray, would you call it, uh, between the fin rays. And that's, uh, I don't know, to me, it's the transparent. You're looking through that fin, and that membrane is so thin that you can see the rocks and uh, whatever's behind that fish. Um, if we painted that fin all white and put some yellow on it, um, it would be good for most walleye mounts. But we like to paint transparency into our fins mm -hmm. because they're going to be against the wall. And if you painted them white and yellow, they're going to be kind of yeah. a one-colored fish. If you can look at this fin, um, this fin, we actually put a gray bluey color in between in that thin membrane. And then the rest of it, um, we hit with a little yellow and we'll put our white on there. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. And we've done an assortment of things. If you will watch from the front, I'm going to take, you mixed me up a nice Payne's gray. And remember, if you're using um, Createx, the secret to Createx is mix it up, what would you say? 15, 20 minutes ahead of time. It's nice. And they say yeah. that it emulsifies, and that to me just means it dissolves real good. And so we thinned it down with some 4011. 4011 works good for us. There's a lot of different thinners. And with the Wicked colors, they don't have to worry about getting it too thin. They can you can really thin the wicked color, colors. Can you do this with your airbrush? I bet you can. not You, not you, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the viewer. Look at I don't know, I can do that, that looks nice. Look at that fine line. It's Be so careful, fine. she's gonna zoom in on you. It's so fine that I could never hold it steady enough with that fine line, look at that. That's pretty good, isn't it? That is pretty good. Yeah, it's nothing special except Createx and some 4011, thin down, quite thin. The secret to um, intricate marking like this is low air pressure, I'd say. What air pressure are you using? Um, this is a Iwata HPC. Yep. Um, and like Brett has told you before, there is not an air cap in here. And we worked with Iwatas for 10 years before you read the directions. And I was told to by Mike Orthaber. <laughs> and told us that that air cap is not an aid in painting, but a protection for the needle. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's what the air cap is. So if you see us without the air cap on here, we unscrew it and drop it. I had to sweep the floor to find it, it this afternoon. Um, it really increases sales of air caps too. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> and uh, um, it, it should paint real well. It'll paint real well for you with, with the air cap off. But because your needle is, because your needle is, how would I do? I broke it. Oh, there we go. Because your needle is um, um, exposed, you're a good chance you're going to break it. Or bend yes, it. you very well. And then, if you bend it, we got sharpen air. Sharpen air has saved us. We just did it the other day. I bent my needle. Um, once they fall on the floor, for some reason, they'll always end up on this end. Uh, bend the needle, and then you're going to have to buy a new needle at what's an I want a needle, probably thirty some dollars, maybe. Yep. Okay, yep. now, or sharpen air for forty some dollars, and you can sharpen needles for the rest of your life. I'm going to take that, that uh, Payne's gray color and I'm going to paint the membrane between my fin rays on the back of this fish. And the reason I'm doing it on the back is so that you can't see me. 
No. The reason I'm doing it on the back is because it's going to give me a nicer effect on the front. I, I do it on the front, I get it all over, and I think, ah, oh, man, I made a mess of it. If I do it on the back, it shows through very nicely. I bet if Kate zoomed in on the front side, it would show through as you're doing it. Yeah, that's scary for me. I know, but you're going to do so good. Oh, yeah, that's showing. That's coming through nice. It is? Yep. Really? Yeah. So I did good? Mm-hmm. So for our new product meeting, we need to figure out what we're going to sell when they drop to sharpen air. <laughs> Surely there's something. Carpet mats. Carpet mats, yeah, carpet mats. Ooh, that's looking good. So you're spraying in between the rays, but the nice thing about spraying on the back side is even if you get on top of the ray, it's thick enough. It's opaque and won't show right. it won't change the color of the back side. So um, now this isn't necessary, nice. but um, you'll start to do little things like this to your fish that we show you, and you're gonna hopefully decide it looks better and more lifelike and more professional, and start to incorporate it on your mounts. Oh, it is looking. Yeah. See? Now, now I'm going to do just a little more, and then I might transfer to the front a little bit. Now, this is a good time to tell them, too, um, if you are going to paint on the back side and then turn to the front, make sure that you're painting the back side first, because if you start on the front side and then go to the back, it it's going to huh? intensify as you go to the back side. So um, make sure that you start on the back and then go to the front, and you'll have a nice, soft transition. Almost got it. They never would have known. Okay. Now to clean out my airbrush, I'm just going to take a, a little reducer. Put it in here. And this uh, Createx paint is harmless to you. It's not going to hurt you like any of the other solvents. So I just take my finger and clean out my, my bowl. Because we're not in into, California. I know, spray it into a rag. I always back bubble it. Hold, hold your finger over the needle and back bubble it. That flushes all that paint that's in the color adjusting parts out. Always move your finger back before you let your needle go forward. And I'm sure I'm going to tip that over. Okay, um, now. Those little color cups are, or mixing cups are nice because of what you just did because they've got a lid for them. Now I'm going to painting. show you, and they're, they're nice if you remember to put the lid back on. Um, <laughs> another method of doing this, which is easy also, and some of you might be intimidated by trying to spray that, is your pan pastels. Um, this works also very well. Take your pan pastel in a one of the darker grays or a blue, and with a fine brush, 
um, you can hit between the rays real nice and smoothly. Now that evened out any of my splotchy painting from the back. One nice thing about the pastel, it's so easy to control. You can keep that right in between the fin rays um, without having to worry about overspray from your airbrush. Even you can turn your airbrush down nice and fine and spray in between, but um, the pastels are a nice quick, um, quick method of doing basically the same thing. Now, on the back, I thought I did a pretty good job. When I turned it over to the show side, I had dark areas and light areas where I kind of hit it a little hard in some places. And I thought I can grab my airbrush and I can do it in the front. Oh, I'm going to probably end up with the same thing. Um, my pan pastels, take a, see if you can zoom in on that anal fin down here. Um, it evened it out pleasantly for me. Remember, with your pan pastels, always seal them or they're going to leave when you sneeze, just like hairspray. Now, another thing I'd like to do is there's markings on most of your fins. And you can see on this uh, pectoral fin up here, there's all kinds of little dark markings. And I'm just going to take one of the Creotex paints that you mixed up in a brown and a fine brush. And I'm going to hit those, just highlight them a little bit. I don't want to paint them. I just want to put a little burst of paint on them to darken them up. And I'm not inventing them. I'm putting them exactly where, where they were, where the fish had them. Again, you can airbrush these. Um, we did some real fine markings uh, similar to that on the lower belly with the pan pastels last week. Um, so that's another, with those fine micro applicator, that's another um, And this would be a, a good pan pastel spot too. Yeah, yeah. And I'm getting most of my paint off on the paper before I put it on the fish's spin. I'm not sure she can see that. I bet not. I'm sorry. Around the corner. That's me. There you go. Here she comes. That's a seminar trick when you're not sure. You just I know. To turn it sideways so nobody Look can that. see. I got paint on me. Okay, now I'm going to spray. We want a little yellow on this fin. I'm going to angle spray. For those of you that don't know what angle spray is, I'm going to take a little yellow, get it spraying in a nice medium spray, and I'm going to spray sideways, just like snow blowing across the field. I'm going to catch on every little high spot. So I'm going to catch on this ray, this ray, this ray, this ray. And it's all about positioning. You're going to want to turn the fish if you can. I don't know if you can get high. <laughs> this is there dangerous. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Angle spraying, I think, is one of the more important um, concepts for in fish painting that you have so many contours versus painting on a flat piece of paper, um, you can really use those angles to your advantage to, to create some nice shadows and effects. Now, anytime you do any kind of detail painting, make sure your airbrush is spraying the way you want it before we transfer to the fish. 
Or now. before you go live on Facebook? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> um, now, this is important. By angle spraying, I have to shoot it at this direction because you want to shoot it, I guess I'd say, um, perpendicular to the rays. Yeah. Yep. So I want to shoot it this direction. The problem is I have all of this white belly right behind there. So I have to be conscious of wherever I spray here, it's going to give a big old um, yellow belly bullhead to this yeah. walleye. <laughs> so I'm going to get it spraying nice. I'm going to take a card, and we used to use photographs all the time. Old photographs, because I had a lot of old photographs, because I was such a bad photographer. <laughs> I had an abundance of old photographs. Um, I'm going to stick this card behind here to protect, come on baby, protect that, and then I'm going to spray. I don't think their iPhone will fit behind that pin. Oh, look at that warm up, that looks nice. It's just taken on a really nice soft yellow cast. Uh oh, police are coming. <laughs> and as you're doing angles, you can you can do angles on any even scales themselves if you're doing little scale details using your angles will help um, help create shadows and contours even on deer noses we angle oh, spray yeah, absolutely yep. all of our mammal noses yeah um, that's a trick if you haven't if you if you aren't familiar with the process um, we build up all our segments on our noses mm -hmm. and by spraying at different angles you protect the flesh in between and it it's pretty helpful yeah very much now i'm trying to be real careful because you all are watching so close yeah, they're not going to let you get away with anything i know that's what i was thinking but that's uh now i i didn't paint the white on that fin because you had done it when you did the belly mm -hmm. And um, by being careful where I put it, I don't think I even have to, so yeah. I saved a little step there. But that's kind of how we, how we treat the fins, and we do that on replicas too. And mm -hmm. one of my favorite things to do is get the box open from a replica that we got from Lake Country, for instance, mm -hmm. and all the fins are separate, and nothing makes me more relaxed than sit down and attempting to paint you know a walleye yeah. fin or a pike fin or whatever it yeah. happens to be it's just it's fun for me yeah. um but anyway by painting all the fins first then you can put them on when you have skin mount fish um, we don't take the fins off of the skin mount fish so we tend to use cards to protect them but that's that's how we would handle that process and you can kind of see the flesh still um the flesh that uh you had put on the other day i'm sure um just looks real lifelike. I just like that. Nice and soft. And um, when we're painting the body of the fish, um, I think you did all the marks on the back and everything on that one, correct? Yeah. When you're painting the backs of the fish, sometimes I end up, everybody says, when do you tip your fish? In the beginning or the end or in between? I oftentimes, I oftentimes, because I mess them up, have to paint, have to tip my fish two or three times. Yeah. But that sometimes can be a big advantage because when you do it last, if you were to do, if you were to put um, your gold tipping on that fish that you painted last, it's going to come off like 24 karat. Yeah. It's much too harsh. Yeah. If you do it first, it's going to get covered up if you're not careful by all the other colors that you put on the body mm -hmm. of the fish. So first isn't the best, last isn't the best in between yes, so I end up doing yeah. it uh, sometimes three times. So this fish has been um, tipped. He's been darkened a little, back, little on the back, but by the time we get finished and darken that 
dorsal ridge, um, he, we may n need to come in with a watered down. Yep. Um, and don't think that you have to use it straight out of the, you know, liquid scales, you know, yeah. for instance, or Perlex, whichever you're using. You don't have to make it ultra gold. You can dilute it and and sure. come up with a very nice effect. Yeah. But I think that'll give you an idea of how to do um, almost up yeah. to where you got. I think, yeah, they can move through the rest of the fish. Um, if they want to change the body colors, they can put a little green over the back. We don't see a whole bunch of green on our walleyes. Um, if you want to increase your yellows, but we accomplished a whole bunch of color without really putting point a lot of Point out on this that. fish, because it looks so nice. Point out some of the things you did from where we are done here. Oh um, gosh. I mean, um, your face, your face is really pretty. Um, or along the, the lateral line, I see some blue. Um, yeah, we did just, so from where Tom is, we finished out all the fins. Um, I think we did just a, a little hint of a dark green up along the, um, basically from the lateral line up. Um, there's just a little so that we created some contour and some change in the, in the side of the fish, the shape. Um, also came through and after we got the base colors down, um, came in with Perlex powders um, straight, which we had showed you last week, putting them into some of the liquid scales, but we added just some, a little bit of the powder here in the front of the very front of the face, right in front of the eye. Um, I like to do some of that. Um, a little down below and brought it back through um, some of the superculum and um, a little bit back through here up high and basically just some accents. We brought in some pearl that is not real showing um, not showing real bright, but right down through here, there's a little bit more pearl colors and in with our flesh. And so we just kind of brought a little bit more detail looking at our reference pictures um, and just tried to add just a little bit of depth to him and some reflective values. Uh, you mentioned the lateral line. Um, I think it's more cosmetic than anything, but we came down the lateral line with a it's pretty. kind of a blue green accent on the high spots. Um, that's a duo we've, color. We've um, done that, that for that years. We've like, used yeah. we used to use uh, um, life tone pearl, Ir yeah. pearl uh, iridescent yep. pearl and stuff. Yeah. Um, so just went through those and um, finished out. I think the biggest difference between where you are and where we are here is just finishing through some of those yellows. Um, the yellow really brings a fish to life. You could see the ones that Tom had just starting. He's got a third or a quarter of that fish and it really started to come to life. So the yellows made a big difference on it. Um, and then finally, just kind of angle sprayed him and shaded with some dark color. Try to stay away from black, but it kind of used a dark black green on top of the head to blend in some of the markings that we had. And, brought that down, angle sprayed the dorsal, angle sprayed the soft dorsal, and the, the caudal fin. Um, and don't be afraid to explain to your customers a little bit about what you did. If they're jumping up and down and they think your fish is like the best fish they've ever seen, then show them a little bit what you have yeah. done because there's not a customer out there yeah. that's really gonna believe that you paint those scales oh, with the gold. Yeah. We put a lot of effort um, show them what you do and yeah. uh, they'll take it home and they'll compare it to another fish that they have on the wall and yeah. they'll bring that in and want you to cosmetically, you know, retouch <laughs> that too. So um, you can really impress people by showing them what you do. Yep. So the next step is going to be some kind of a finish, right? Yep. Yep. I think that's going to be one. Everything we've done up to here adds a level of lifelike look to him, but Nothing ties it all together like a nice, a nice finish, a nice gloss finish. Um, and um, we've done everything. We've, oh man, being in the business as long as I have, um, I started, we used to use a marine epoxy type of gloss. So we used mm -hmm. to mix A and B together and it was for spraying on cabin cruisers, you know, it's on for boats. Sure. Um, at one time, anything in the taxidermy industry, you'll know, isn't meant for taxidermists. It's meant for something else, like <laughs> yeah. the marine marine world. And I would paint my fish, um, and used to. I think to begin with, we used to brush it on, yeah. and it worked really well. And then pretty soon, that was on a 
unavailable. So then you have to have some kind of a finish that doesn't yellow because if you put a varnish on a fish that's going to turn yellow over time, this yellow is going to intensify so much yeah. that he's going to be a canary yeah. walleye. And so you need something that's going to stay, um, I guess, UV stable, if yeah. lack of a better word, but something that's not going to change color. I used to take a big piece of tag board and all the different varnishes I could find, I would make a little square and I would paint it and I would mm -hmm. date it and um, I'd hang it in my shop. And some of them turned so orange over time that it yeah. will completely change the color of your fish. Oof. And some of them yep. that I used, I see those fish after about 20 years and I go, oh my gosh, I hope <laughs> he doesn't remember who did it because they're, they've changed color so much. Um, and orange cast on your greens and on your blues and um, mm -hmm. it's gonna change everything. So we, uh, went to then a two-part automotive finish mm -hmm. and we used that for years and years and years it's a high solids high solids to me means thick it goes mm -hmm. on thick we sprayed it through a big automotive sprayer um, mix it up it's very expensive to gloss this fish was probably two to three dollars a finish mm -hmm. on it but we thought it was worth it it gave it a really nice um, finish a nice wet look and stayed clear. If it was made for the automotive industry, you kind of got to be guaranteed, you know, it's sure. not going to yellow in time. You don't see a nice, you know, white Mercedes driving <laughs> down that turned yellow over time. Hope not. Um, recently, uh, but it's expensive and you waste a lot. Yep. Recently, um, we were introduced to um, Clear Glamour, 2K Clear Ga Glamour from Spraymax. And we've been using this for a long time. Uh -huh. And it's, you shake it up. I get it ready, you wanna do it? Sure. Um, first thing I'm gonna do is you take this red cap. There'll be directions on here and it's for professional use only. We're professionals, right? <laughs> um, so we're gonna take this red cap off of here. The directions are in it, on it. And on the bottom, you'll see that it's got a little extension. I'm going to take the red cap, place it on the extension, and we're going to puncture the catalyst that's inside of here. So that's two chambers. So the catalyst and the, the vehicle are, are separated now until you puncture it. That's what they say. That's scary. So, but you never, you can't tell if you puncture it. Can you? I mean, it doesn't say I'm punctured or it doesn't, um, there's no, no sign. You can, so we puncture it like that, and hopefully it's I been done. I think it has to be able, there you go. I think it has to be able to pop back down. Did it pop back down? I think so. Now we're going to shake it. Depress it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now it's got a cushiony. Yep. And what do they say? Shake it for how many? A couple minutes, minute. right? Yeah, I think a solid minute. Now... This is going to give you an automotive finish, and it's meant for automotive touch-ups. Yep. So this is basically just like the stuff that we were spraying in the big gun, um, but we don't have to mix up a whole pot of it. And how much is this? Mm, 24, 26 20 bucks, dollars. something. Yep. Now you think, oh my gosh, $26 gloss one fish. You're not going to use it on one fish. You're going to use it on that fish, and we've got 48 hours, don't we? And we've, we've had way more. Yeah, we've, we've had, had way more than 48. We've had but, yeah. five to six days yep. on occasion. The can says Maybe because I didn't shake it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we're going to gloss this fish for you today. Um, we will finish painting that one tomorrow. Um, the muskie's ready to go. There's a northern ready to go. Um, we should probably have about five fish, oh, and I that's about so. what we can get out of this yes. can. So yes. you're going to have two, three, four dollars. Little yeah. fish, you're going to have a couple dollars. Yeah. Big fish, that muskie will probably have a three or four dollar gloss to it. Yeah. But uh, this will spray. Um, like I said, we've had it go for five to six days. Yeah. Whenever we get done glossing fish, um, we leave it lay on the counter and check it every day just to see how long it'll go. Yeah. So I think I sh I've shaken it up really well. I don't need that anymore. And I'll run the exhaust fan for you. 
Now with our Createx, we don't use um, the exhaust fan, have no use for it, but you do want it for your glosses because they, they will leave a haze. You got him? Go ahead. And you left the clay on the eyes, right? I have it on to this point, but I think we're going to take it off. Um, and we're going to, this is the nice thing about the oil-based clay, is it comes off very, very easily in one nice big piece. So we're just going to work it off like so. Double check your perimeter and make sure that you've got, that you've got all of your clay out of there, all of your color. I'm going to go around the edge just a little bit. Need some paint? Um, I think I can, I think I've just got a little oh, bit of clay, clay right there. Yeah. And if you do have anything around your perimeter, um, pan pastel works great. It's super easy to go around here and clean up. I might just use a little bit of that, of a dark pan pastel, the yellow ochre extra dark or the, the, uh, one of the browns that the, the umber extra dark. There we go. There's just a little piece right there. I'm just going to touch that with a little micro applicator just to blend that little bit of a halo in. You competition people um, would do well to have a little container, different assortment of pan pastels and some applicators oh, for that last minute. Oopses. I can't tell you how many times. I would have died to have had just a little pan pastel, just a little bit. You can see we blended that in real nice, nice and easy. Um, and we don't really have to fix it down because the gloss is our last step. And so we'll do that now. I'm going to start on the back, just give a, a nice little light dusting to the back, making sure that everything is spraying well. I know it's spraying well. I'm going to hit inside I'm the mouth. I'm going to run this periodically for you. We're not going to try to get a full wet look yet. We're going to hit him lightly. And then ideally, we would let him sit how long? Maybe three, four minutes. Yeah. Just enough for the first coat to tack up. And that way, you can put on a little bit heavier second coat. Sometimes what we've found is that if you saturate and really put the first coat down heavily, um, one, if it hasn't had time to, to really cure, um, you can cause your paints to run. Another thing is um, it's much more likely to drip and get, and get runs in it. So uh, we usually put on one nice, um, one nice coat and then we'll let them sit, move on to the next fish, maybe do four or five at a time. And by the time you're done spraying the, the fourth and fifth fish, the first one's ready to come back and do again. So we'll do this another time and really build up the, the gloss on this coat. We might not get it quite as glossy just so everybody in here that's not wearing a respirator doesn't choke, um, but uh, we'll give it a nice gloss now. And remember, just like with your airbrush, angles are very important. Um, I haven't done anything to come in from behind this um, pectoral fin yet just because of the where I am on the table. 
So ideally, I would come around from the back and make sure that I'm, I'm also spraying behind this. Um, I'm just going to turn the fish and do that quickly. For you, like so. I'm also going to make sure that I'm getting the belly. We'll get a nice shot on the belly, the underside. Underside of the jaw. Careful not to tip your can too much. I think, I think any aerosols spray better when they're more upright. Ooh, that really came to life. And then if we were quite finished for our final, final coat, I think we'd try to lay them flat. Don't we usually mm -hmm. like to, um, especially our single-sided fish, just in case, because we do like to put a heavy, a heavy gloss on, and, and that way, if it were to run, it runs toward the back. I mean, you, sh you shouldn't have any problem with runs, but um, do that, watch would, them. that would save you. We like to babysit these for at least 10 or 15 minutes. It'll give you a good idea of, of how your glosses are going to lay on there. But that's really, that's really it for um, that's pretty. Um, applying a final finish. Are we done with this project? We got to put him on something next week. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost. We're almost done. Uh -huh. We're gonna we're gonna do a fast habitat for him. Um, really enhance him. Yeah, yep. Um, and do we have a giveaway? We do have a giveaway, and a giveaway is this is a good giveaway. Um, is a Spray giveaway. Max 2K. I think last week I gave away one micro applicator because I was afraid I was gonna get in trouble. <laughs> uh, this stuff is if if you're a fish person. Um, this is our new best friend. Yeah. We like it. Yep. Um, and the winner is? The winner is Paula Zielinski. Paula, I hope you like fish. Otherwise, I hope you know, <laughs> have a fellow taxidermist who likes fish because you're going to like this. Um, anything you want glossed in an ultra gloss, easy to use, um, good for, I mean, this can is more than three-fourths full. It's, yeah. It's... There's a lot in here and a lot of glossing left to do. And you're going to give that one another heavy coat. Yep. And after next week, I think we are uh, um, we want to show you um, maybe caping and measuring. The, yeah. We just think it's really important. So many people struggle in how to, uh, their, cape, their cape doesn't fit their form. And it all starts with the minute it comes in the door taking accurate, accurate yeah. measurements. We're going to go over tagging, um, measuring. We're going to do some measurements that maybe you're not used to that are really going to help you out when it comes time to yeah. mounting. Um, maybe some form selection um, and eventually caping, caping that yeah. animal out and how to take care of it and get it safely into your tan or to the tannery. Yeah, it's that time of year. We're already seeing pictures popping up, so um, that'll come just um, It's amazing. Um, not to pick on our audience, but we get a lot of calls where something doesn't fit oh, and we'll gosh. say, what do you have for measurements? Well, I didn't measure him, but I know he's kind of like the deer that the guy got last year and that went on this, you know, form. Yeah. Um, it's way more important than that. And so we're going to mm -hmm. kind of refresh you and get a system into your shop that every skin is going to fit the form and you're not going to struggle. When you have to struggle sewing up, yep. taxidermy is not fun anymore. Yep. Too much skin is just as bad as not enough. Too. Oh, exactly. So, yep. We'll go through all that stuff. Thank you very much for joining us one more time. I'm glad to be back. Um, thanks for watching Brett, you know, <laughs> show you how to paint a fish. And, and I was looking at him, but I <laughs> was not much help. Uh, we'll